What have I told you guys repeatedly about this time of the year? I'll say it again because I say it all the time and I'm going to continue to repeat myself because it bears mentioning. Believe half of what you see, none of what you hear, even if it's spat by me, your man, Louis T. It's lion season, man. And the 49ers let off some loud shots on Friday. And the fog and the smoke is getting real thick from those shots. As a wise man once told me, gun smoke, gun smoke. Could it be me, your man, Louis T. Well, to the 151st installment of the Louis T. Network podcast, I, of course, am your set man, Louis T. Thank you for joining me on the program. A lot to get to on today's show. Before we get to any of the proceedings this evening, I want to first talk about this time of the year, because uh, this time of the year brings about a lot of good. It also brings out the ugly in a lot of people. Let me talk to y'all for a second and, and something that was on my chest. All right, let me get this off my chest real quick. This time of the year can be very frustrating for me. People get on my nerves this time of the year. First and foremost, everybody this time of the year turns into a certified NFL scout and GM, and this player should be picked here, and this guy isn't any good. Everybody knows everything, okay? And look, I'm not here to look down my nose, and I have a very large nose, so I'd have to look down quite a ways. I'm not here to look down my nose at anybody because, hell, I do the same thing. We're all, you know, armchair uh, GMs and, and scouts this time of the year, okay? That said, some people take it to the umpteenth degree, okay? Some people take it to the extremes, such as if you don't like this player or you like this player and they don't like that player, then you're an effing dumbass and you don't know anything. And I'm like, why well, has it got to be all of that? Because I don't agree or you don't agree with me. Like, can't we all just get along? I mean, seriously, half of us don't even know, really, we, none of us know what the hell we're talking about. Hell, even the people that get paid to do this don't even know what the hell they're talking about 70% of the time, all right? This is an inexact science, this NFL draft thing. None of us truly know what the hell is going on. You can only hope that this guy projects well, and if your team picks him, that he performs the way that you thought if you thought he was going to be good, and he proves you wrong if you didn't. Either way, I just thought that bear mentioning, man. People can be some assholes this time of the year when it comes to, you know, players and prospects, where they should go and when, when, when they should be selected, and is this guy any good? Is he not good? It is what it is. I, I don't get bent out of shape about anything. I just thought it bared mentioning. That said, how are you guys doing on this Tuesday uh, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are? Um, I know this is a weird day. You know, normally we're Monday, Wednesday, Friday on the podcast. Uh, this week has been crazy. Don't get me started. We're going to talk about all of these different things that have just thrown my schedule out of whack, including my son, who, God bless him. I love him to death. Wouldn't trade him for the world, but he's got to take his ass back to daycare. He is just killing me we'll talk about that another day uh but anyway i digress so much going on in the world of the national football league the nfl draft started to heat up on friday with those trades so much conversation around what the 49ers are going to do at three i was adamant about my stance as to what was going to take place generally i make a declaration and then I double down, and if I have to die on that hill, I die on that hill, like the Deshaun Watson situation. I made a declaration. The Texans aren't trading him. I doubled down on my stance. I'm going to die on that hill, and if, if they ultimately do trade him, then I'll come back and I'll offer up a double up, okay? It's not uncommon for me to have to offer up a double O, but 
I tell you right, I'm right more than I'm wrong. That's for damn sure. And so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to double down on the things that I said on Friday's podcast. But there are a few tweaks. Okay, we'll talk about that today. I'm fascinated by the 49ers at number three. Speaking of which, that leads me right in today's gym dropping session. Let me drop this gym on your melon. Open your mind, let your conscience be free. You're now rolling with your man, Louis T double E. Let me open you up. Get you thinking a little bit. So the 49er situation at three to me is one of the biggest enigmas and draft draft drama specials we've seen in quite some time. I can't think of a more juicy, drama-filled draft selection over the last decade than the Niners at three. I mean, because nobody cares if somebody trades up to number 13. Nobody really gives a shit. And generally, that happens during the draft. So there's not a lot of time for that to simmer and for you to come up with plausible reasons as to why and who they're coming up to get. Like, normally, we're not talking about a trade in March if the draft isn't until April. So the fact that this trade is taking place when it did causes for tons of speculation. Everybody's got their own theory as to why it happened and who it's for let the damn games begin and i've been taking all of this in over the last 72 hours or so kind of just playing around with different scenarios in my head as to what the 49ers could be thinking look I i told you at the top of the show believe half of what you see none of what you hear even if it's spat by me your man louis t so The fact that the brain trust of the 49ers, GM John Lynch, head coach Kyle Shanahan, decided to go to Tuscaloosa to see the pro day of one Mac Jones, his second pro day, I might add. Instead of going to Ohio State's second pro day, or specifically Justin Fields' second pro day, They didn't go to Columbus. They sent their assistant general manager and a different conglomerate to Columbus for the Justin Fields Pro Day. A lot of people making a big deal out of that. Oh, he's choosing a side right now. He's telling you something. I don't know about that. See, I'm in the camp and in the way of thinking that the 49ers who were also at Trey Lance's Pro Day uh, back in early March. And Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch were both there. I think Trey Lance is the guy. Now, I'm not moving off of that hill. I'm not. Now, I may ultimately be wrong. And as Daniel Jeremiah said, all signs point to Mac Jones being the guy right now. But he's not definitively saying that Matt Jones is going to be the pick at three. As a matter of fact, when the trade was first made, much like myself, Daniel Jeremiah came to the same conclusion. Now, he got there in a different way, and his way makes a lot more sense than the way that I was thinking. Okay? So what DJ said, and you know I respect the hell out of DJ. DJ said, the trade was made for Trey Lance. And here's his rationale as to why. He said that the 49ers were adamant about not trading Jimmy Garoppolo. They like Jimmy. There's still value in having him on the roster. Translation, we're drafting a guy that we don't think is ready year one. We'd love to have a veteran in front of him so that he doesn't have to play, a la Patrick Mahomes, Alex Smith. You let that guy sit, learn for a year, and then you hope he takes off running in year number two. That sounds like Trey Lance. But DJ didn't stop there. Daniel Jeremiah continued on and he said, look, if you were really 
excited about Mac Jones and you thought he was the guy, why pull the trigger now? He hasn't even had his pro day yet. He's having another pro day on Tuesday. Why not just wait until you get confirmation there, until you watch him spin it, until you get to talk to him, you get to talk to his coaches, and you get the full experience of what it's like to be around this guy and whether or not he's the right man for the job. All valid points. They've already had that opportunity with Trey Lance, which made them more comfortable trading up to number three and knowing that if they didn't get their hands on Trevor Lawrence, highly unlikely, I'd say that probably resides at 0% right now that they'll get tre uh, Trevor Lawrence. Highly unlikely that they'll come away with Zach Wilson. I'd put that at mm, maybe 1.5% chance that they get their hands on Zach Wilson. Highly unlikely as well. And then that leaves you at number three, where you've got three options sitting right in front of you. Uh, uh, look, I said this the day the trade was made. The fact that we're having this discussion about whether the miggity, 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 miggity Mac Daddy, Mac Jones is the, the, the guy that the 49ers traded up the three to get was preposterous. And if you're having that conversation, what are you drinking, fluid? Well, I'll make sure on draft day, I've got some fluid right next to me so that if they pull the trigger on Mac Jones at three, I'll take a sip of some fluid. Because I still don't think there is any way on God's green earth that the 49ers came all the way up to number three to get Mac Jones. I just find that so hard to believe. Here's why I feel that way. If you're the 49ers and you're sitting there at 12 and Mac Jones is the guy that tickles your fancy, you just sit there at 12 on draft day. There's no need to make this trade right now. I get it. Everybody's uh, posturing and jockeying for position. And you just want to make sure you get yours. And you know my mantra. You know my motto. Get your guy when you feel the need to get your guy. I, I understand all of that. So I'm not here to point fingers if Matt Jones, in fact, is the guy. Even though I think that is crazy talk. If you're the 49ers and you sit there at 12 and Mac Jones is the guy that tickles your fancy, there's a chance he might just fall to you. But look, let's not leave this to chance. I get it. You want your guy. So why not just sit there, all right, at 12 and have five, six, and seven all be magic spots for you? Why not just do that? I highly doubt that anybody else is fighting over Mac Jones as the third or fourth quarterback taken off the board in this draft. Now, I, I can't say that for sure, which is why they went up to number three, potentially, just to make sure. Leave all chances and all doubts in the background, okay? You put all of that to rest when you just go up and eliminate all of the other outcomes than the one that you want by going up to number three. You eliminate all of those other outcomes. You remove all margin for error when you go up to number three. Cost you a pretty penny. When you could have sat at 12, if you really wanted Mac Jones, if all of this shit is for Mac Jones, you could have sat at 12 on draft day. Watch Trevor Lawrence go one to the Jags. Watch Zach Wilson go two to the Jets. Figured out what the Dolphins were going to do. Are they going to pull the trigger on a player? Are they going to trade out and allow somebody to come up and get a quarterback? More likely than not, the Dolphins were sellers. In a buyer's market, they were looking to sell the third pick in the draft. Maybe somebody comes up. Maybe the Panthers get antsy. They come up and get their guy. I don't know. We'll see. But that's the that's the chance I would have been willing to take. So the Dolphins, let's just say they trade out of the pick. Somebody comes up and gets a quarterback. We know that's what this position does to teams. They get antsy. They can't hold their water like the 49ers. And so somebody probably comes up. Let's just say Carolina comes up to number three. And they wanted Justin Fields. They thought Atlanta was going to uh, take him. 
at three or they wanted Trey Lance, whatever the case may be. Let's just, let's go with my list. I said Trey Lance was the third best quarterback in this draft. So they come up to number three to get Trey Lance in front of Atlanta and the Falcons say, that's cool. We'll take Justin Fields, no problem. And they take him at four. Now you're watching and you're trying to see where do I need to get up to get Matt Jones if in fact I need to go up. Now, if the Panthers don't move, that's usually, that's the place where everybody's saying, hey, you got to get in front of the Panthers. They want a quarterback. I don't think the Panthers are all that intrigued by Mac Jones. I could be wrong. Again, I don't know any of this to be factual. Can't confirm nor deny any of this. But any, any in any event, we know the Eagles are now willing to move out of six. You could have easily picked up the phone after the fourth quarterback was taken in four picks and the Bengals sit on the clock at number five. You could have easily sat there and said, all right, Bengals aren't taking a quarterback. They took one last year. So I don't have to worry about them. They're not even trying to move. I picked up the phone. I called them. They told me to, to get lost, kick rocks. So they're not moving out of five. So then the Eagles sit there. Turns out they wanted a guy. He's not going to be available. Looks like Cincinnati's going to take their guy off the board, or maybe they wanted a quarterback, whatever the case may be. They're not happy at six. In this buyer's market, they're looking to sell. There's your opportunity to get up into the top seven and get your quarterback right there at six. Why did you need to come up to number three to get Mac Jones? I don't really understand that dynamic. That's why it can't be Mac Jones for me. You could have waited until draft day to do this and not have given up as much draft capital as you gave up if Mac Jones is the guy. I just find it hard to believe that Mac Jones on... Five teams boards is better than Trey Lance and Justin Fields. I find that hard to believe. I do. I just do. So the likelihood that if Mac Jones is the guy you want more so than Trey Lance, more so than Justin Fields, that, that the Falcons want Mac Jones. Maybe they do. Maybe they see him as a Matt Ryan clone and they want another exact replica. I doubt that. I really do. They, the, everyone sees where this league is going. There will be exceptions to the rule. There will be guys that aren't as mobile, who are pocket passers, who will thrive in this league. It, it won't be a league full of athletic guys running around making plays, even though everyone's looking for their version of Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray, Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers. Everybody's looking for their version of Josh Allen. Everybody's looking for the next Justin Herbert. Everyone's looking for one of those guys. But every now and again, there will be an exception to the rule. And maybe a guy like Matt Jones will keep the, the old fossils alive, like the, like the uh, uh, Tom Brady's and the Drew Breeses and the Philip Rivers and the, you know, uh, 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 Ben Roethlisberger's and these guys that can't move anymore. Maybe... A guy like Mac Jones and, and a Matt Ryan, maybe Mac Jones keeps that flame that's barely flickering. Maybe he keeps it alive and burning bright. And maybe another guy comes down the road and, and he's able to be really nifty within the confines of the pocket to create that extra second that he needs. Got great pocket mobility, great, you know, wherewithal and, and great presence in the pocket, stare down the gun barrel, take a shot, knows where to go with the football, and a team has a great offensive line and they're comfortable with that guy not having tremendous mobility. Maybe Matt Jones is that guy. I'm not saying that he isn't. Hard for me to believe, though, when you've got all these athletes with big arms circling around, that you're going to bypass all of them to get to Matt Jones. It's just hard for me to buy that. This, this feels, this smells, this tastes like going and bypassing Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes for Mitchell Trubisky. That's what this tastes like. That's what, that's what this smells like. If the 49ers go all the way to three, say, excuse me, Trey Lance, pardon me, Justin Fields, Watch out, guys. I'm coming up here to get Matt Jones. The miggity, 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 Mac, daddy. The miggity, 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 Mac. They coming up here to get Mac Jones. This feels, this smells, 
this taste like Mitchell Trubisky in the Bears bypassing the likes of Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes. Trading up into the top. Well, they were number three and they traded up to two to do so. We'll see. But that's the first thing. Who are they trading up to draft? I still contend it's Trey Lance. Now, Daniel Jeremiah has changed his tune because the more he sits and thinks and he listens to people and he talks to people, he's starting to lean towards Mac Jones. I'm not moving. It's Trey Lance for me. And I thought the point that he made about if they're trading Jimmy Garoppolo, which to me is the next thing I want to talk about. How does Jimmy Garoppolo fit into this equation? So, I don't know if you watch, excuse me, watch the pro day of Mac Jones or Justin Fields today. They were on NFL Network. I don't watch any of that shit. I get all of my information uh, from third, so, you know, party sources, whether it's Twitter or it's Bleacher Report or ESPN or whatever. Somebody will, if something noteworthy happens, I'll get a notification. I don't have time to watch that shit. All right, we're watching guys in shirt, t-shirt and shorts run around. It's the same thing as the combine. The only difference is I have to watch the combine because I always tell you I watch so you don't have to. Well, I don't have to watch this shit, neither do you. So I don't. But, you know, they were making a big deal about Belichick being there and he was talking to, to Josh McDaniels and there was an overthrow on a deep ball and he was shaking his head. They were talking about something. I don't think that shaking of his head had anything to do with the missed deep ball. People love to do stupid shit and, and stir the pot, whatever. I did find it interesting that the Patriots were there. I think uh, Mac Jones would be the perfect fit in New England. I, and Initially, I had him mocked to go to 15, but that's blowing the smithereens. And I told you, it's funny because we had these conversations about these quarterbacks and I, I said, look, they go up, they don't go back. And I don't, there's no way in hell Mac Jones makes it to 15 now, right? Anyway, I digress. But it, I find it interesting that the Patriots were there. And, you know, Kyle Shanahan and, and John Lynch, they could have went to Columbus. They could have sent their assistant GM to Alabama, to Tuscaloosa, to watch, you know, the Mac Jones Pro Day. But no, they decided to go themselves. Why? I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Maybe, just maybe, they went there because they knew Belichick and Josh uh, and Josh Daniels, McDaniels were going to be there, and they wanted to talk to those guys. Maybe about Jimmy Garoppolo. I don't know. I can only speculate. But you know what I find interesting is that the 49ers have made it known. Hey, we're not looking to move Jimmy Garoppolo. I don't believe a word that anybody says this time of the year. I told you guys that already. You know, when the trade first happened and, and the, the 49ers immediately, not immediately, immediately came out and said, hey, we're not trading Jimmy. Jimmy's not going anywhere. I said, bullshit. I'm pulling your card right now. I don't believe you. You need more people. Well, I don't know if, if it's Mac Jones that they're after. If he's the guy that they've done all of this for. There's a chance that he's pro-ready and they feel like they can move on from Jimmy Garoppolo. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. They can move on from him right now. If it's Trey Lance, and to a lesser degree, Justin Fields, maybe they feel like that guy needs a year to sit, to learn to become a better pro. Not ready for the pro game right away. That's realistic. I could see that. And in that, that scenario, no, you need Jimmy Garoppolo. That's the guy that's gonna get you through the upcoming 2021 season, if he can stay healthy, which hasn't always been you something you can count on and rely on with Jimmy Garoppolo. But I think there is a little bit of validity to that that Jimmy Garoppolo may be the centerpiece to all of this. Because if they really, truly want a guy like Trey Lance, which is the guy that I'm going with in this three-way dance at number three, 
if it is Trey Lance, he's not ready right out of the gate, even though I think he's tailor-made for that zone run blocking scheme. Essentially ran the exact same offense in college. They mirror each other like almost to the T. Ran a pro style offense, looks just like the Shanahan zone run blocking scheme. He could come right in and I feel like fit in hand in glove. But they may say, hey, kids only got 16 starts never thrown an interception, never accounted for a turnover in a real game that actually mattered worth a damn. Don't know how he's going to handle adversity. I'd like to see, like, I'd like to allow him to do this up close and personal. See how it looks, how it feels. And hell, maybe he'll get in a game or two. Maybe we get a couple of ass whoopings going. He gets some mop up duty. Maybe. But if they get Mac Jones, I don't think they feel like they need to do that. Which takes me to my last point. The Chris Sims connection is one that you just can't get around. So why, why does Chris Sims factor into any of this? Number one, he doesn't. But it is something that makes for interesting fodder. So... Chris Sims, for those of you not aware, and Kyle Shanahan are best of friends. They went to the University of Texas together. They played on the football team together. They are chums, okay? Chris Sims, if you remember his list of quarterbacks, had Mac Jones very high on his list, had Trey Lance and Justin Fields very low on his list. He seems to be adamant that Mac Jones is the pick at three for the 49ers, which is why Kyle Shanahan came all the way up to get him. He seems adamant. No doubt in his mind. Pro-style quarterback, fits Shanahan's system to a T. This is his guy, ready to go right out of the packaging. You don't need to wait. This is the guy he's coming up to get. To which Shanahan had to dispel and tell everybody, look, I don't tell that guy anything because he works in the media And if I tell him something, then I have to swear him to secrecy, which Chris is pretty much impossible to keep his damn mouth shut. He tells everything. So I tell him nothing, which I could believe that to a degree. I don't know if Chris Sims has any intimate knowledge or any insider information here on whether Shanahan is smitten by Mac Jones or not. He knows his friend. He knows what kind of a quarterback fits what he tries is trying to do in San Francisco. Maybe Mac Jones is the guy. I still contend it's Trey Lance. And if you're keeping Jimmy Garoppolo, to me, you're keeping him because you're drafting a guy like Trey Lance. It doesn't make any sense to keep him if you're drafting Mac Jones. If you think Mac Jones, if Chris Sims' explanation as to why the 49ers are drafting Mac Jones at three is because he's the most pro-ready quarterback of all the quarterbacks not named Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson. If if that's your explanation, then what purpose does Jimmy Garoppolo serve? He doesn't serve. And, And the 49ers could be lying for all we know. I still don't believe that Garoppolo is sticking around if they draft a quarterback at three, but we know they're drafting a quarterback at three. It's just who are they drafting at three? The reason that Garoppolo, that they said, and again, they could be blowing smoke again. Gun smoke, gun smoke. It's thick. (coughs) It's thick in here. All right. That smoke is thick. The reason they could be blowing smoke. That they went to the owner and asked the owner specifically, can we draft a guy and keep Jimmy on the roster too? To me, the only reason, if that actually did take place, the only reason it would is because you're drafting a guy that you don't think is ready. The only one of those guys out of the three that I would see you needing to absolutely have a quarterback in front of him so that he can sit and learn is Trey Lance. All the rest of these guys look like they're ready to go right out of the packaging. 
Even if they're not, you give them a run, give them a look-see, and you say, hey, hit the ground running, kid. Let's see what you got. The 49ers aren't looking to wait. Their roster is ready to win now. You, you talk to anybody in that front office or around that team, and they'll tell you the only reason they took a step back this year is because of injuries. And Kyle Shanahan still coached the hell out of that team and had them sniffing around postseason contention until the last month of the season when shit pretty much fell apart for them. But they were right there, sniffing around. Couldn't count them out all the way up through November. So, I'm going to tell you right now, this is an interesting, more than interesting. A wise man once told me, don't focus on what's interesting, focus on what's important. Well, to hell with what's important right now, this shit is interesting. This is the shit I want to talk about. Who the 49 is going to take at number three? We're going to have plenty of conversations about this as we get into April and closer to the draft. So that's going to conclude my gym dropping session for today. Before we get to our next segment, I want to first give you a read from one of our sponsors. The Louis T Network is brought to you by Rental Karma. I've talked about Rental Karma and the benefits of upping your credit score and how you can use your credit score to leverage it in a multitude of ways, whether you're looking to purchase a home, you're looking to purchase a vehicle. Look, even opening up a new line of credit, whether you're looking to get a credit card or you're looking to establish some sort of credit, they're going to check your credit score, your credit report. Why not help bolster and boost your credit score by leveraging your rental history. If you are a renter out there like myself, use rentalkarma.com to help boost your credit score. All right. Use your rental history to boost your credit score up to 40 points in just 10 days. Okay. Do you know how much of a difference 40 points can be on your credit report? In just 10 days, we're talking about a matter of two weeks you could see a magnificent difference. All you got to do is go to rentalkarma.com, use the promo code LTN25 for 25% off of their services, and they're going to use your rental history as you input all the data that is necessary to bolster your credit score. You pay your rent on time every single month. You know, it's funny. I was watching a commercial real quick and then we'll move on. I was watching a commercial the other day for one of these apps and they were talking about using your different apps that you purchase, whether it be Netflix or any of these apps out here that you're using to stream things, one of these streaming apps. And I'm like, that's not something you would want on your credit report because there's never a guarantee that those things are going to get paid on time. I can't tell you, I can't speak for you, but there are times where I run low on funds and, and a lot of times I pay for those things with PayPal. And there are times where PayPal may run low and I may forget and I don't realize that the, the funds are low there and they go to take it out and it's not there. And now it's late. And now they're like, hey, dude, Hey, hey, it's past the first of the month. What's good, man? What's up with our $9.99? You tripping over there. You don't have to worry about that with rentalkarma.com. You know why? Because you're going to pay your rent. You're not going to forget about your rent. You're going to make sure you have the requisite amount of money in your account to pay for your rent. So use your rent to leverage your credit score and up it by upwards of 30 to 50 points. As much as 40 points in 10 days. Rentalkarma.com. Use the promo code LTN25 to get you 25% off their services. That's rentalkarma.com. Tell them your man Louis T sent you. So, I want to get to a new segment. It's called Smoke and Mirrors. And this is going to be an NFL draft version of Smoke and Mirrors. And obviously, 
you understand the concept here. A lot of what's being said, what's true, what's not true. How do you feel about what's being said? Are you buying into the hype? Do you think this guy's gonna slide down the draft? Do you think this guy's gonna be plucked off pretty early? Let's talk about some of these players. Let's talk about some of these situations. Let's talk about Smoke and Mirrors NFL Draft Edition. Now, before we get into that, want to first ask you guys to do me a favor. Subscribe to the Louis T Network for more great content if you haven't already done so. If you have, great. That is awesome. Turn on that notification bell. If you've already done that, then the last thing I'm going to ask you to do is hit the like button. Only 53 likes. There are over 160 of you out there watching this live. So please hit the like button if you have not done that to this point. I'm going to go ahead and thank you in advance. Got a super chat. And it's from my man, Colton Wheeler. I really do appreciate you, Colton Wheeler. Thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, greatly, greatly appreciate you. My man, Colton Wheeler writes, Lou, just want to pick your brain. I watched all of your videos. And in one of the recent videos, you said you would probably take Patrick Sertan over Devontae Smith if both were available. Is that just based off of our team needs? Because I think Smith wins us more games. It's funny that you bring that up because I just dug into some more Devontae Smith film. I mean, truly dug into it because, you know, we're doing wide receivers this week on the Draft Prospects 101 series. And so, you know, I've, I watched Devontae Smith for the last... I mean, even going back to his freshman year, bursting onto the scene and catching the touchdown pass in the national championship game in overtime versus Georgia. I mean, the guy burst onto the scene. If you didn't know who he was then, you did after that touchdown grab, and he's just ascended from there. If he would have come out in last year's draft, he would have been a first-round pick. You know, the assumption was he was going to come out, and he would have been a first-round pick last year. But he decided to go back to school and had one of the most historic seasons in college football history at the wide receiver position, set all kinds of records at Alabama and NCAA records, not just SEC records, but NCAA records for the receiver position with his yardage and touchdowns and all of that good stuff, won the Heisman Trophy. And I'm sitting there watching his tape over the weekend and I'm saying to myself, good God, this guy is electric. Man, what he would do to the offense if you were to add him. And I thought to myself and I said, self, at 19, if this guy's there, man, would he be hard to pass up? And I like Patrick Sertan, but I'm not blown away by Patrick Sertan. I think he's good. I don't think he's great. He's not like the Patrick Peterson's of the world that we've seen go in the top five of the draft at the cornerback position. I, I think he's good, you know? Um, I think he's like Kyle Fuller good, and that's not who I'm copying to. I'm just saying, I think he's like Kyle Fuller good. He's good. You'd like to have him, but he's not great. I don't think he's great. I think he's good. I think Devontae Smith has a chance to be great. You just watch him and there's just something about him. I get it. Everybody's going to talk about his weight. And we'll talk more about this guy this week. But, man, is he good. I don't know. I'm starting to rethink that, Colton, honestly. As I was watching him, I said, I don't I don't know about that. And, and I played that same scenario back in my head about, you know, choosing Patrick Sertan. And, yes, uh, to, to answer your question, that was more based off of our needs. I think we need a corner more than we do receiver, especially after taking or, or signing uh, Adam Humphrey. Now, Humphreys is only a one-year deal. It's not like we signed him to a three-year deal just like we did Curtis Samuel. Um, we signed him to a one-year deal. So he could be in and out. And so he'd be hard to pass up if he were there at 19. I still don't think he'll be there at 19. Someone's going to see this guy's talent and, and snatch him up well before he gets to Washington at um, at uh, 19. I'd be shocked if the Dolphins passed on him twice. I mean, they still have 18, right? Did they give that up in the, um, in the deal with the Eagles? Did they give up that second first rounder? 
Or was that a future first rounder? I, I I forget. Let me look at my sheet and see. I got it right here in front of me. Um. Yeah, no, they didn't give up the 18th pick, which they hold. The Dolphins still have 18. I, I just don't see how the Dolphins, if they're not getting a receiver at six, which I'm starting to kind of doubt myself on that at six, I don't see how they would pass on him at 18 if he's still sitting there. Like, how how could you pass on him twice if you're Miami? So, I think I'm starting to rethink that. I really am. I mean, we need cornerback, though. We really do. Like, much more than receiver at this point. But it's all about talent. You know how I feel about the draft, man. Like, forget about needs. Get the most talented player you can get. You can never have enough, unless you're talking about, you know, a few positions on the field, corner or uh, quarterback and tackle being, you know, two of those positions where you're like, look, I already got three tackles on the roster that I, I feel really good about, two starters and a swing guy. Drafting a tackle and those guys are under contract for the next three years, like, what are you doing? Like, that's that's an insane pick. Same with quarterback. If you got a young quarterback, you're not spending a first round pick on another quarterback. That'd be insane. So, you know, they're outside of those two positions. You can never have enough edge rushers. You can never have enough wide receivers. You can never have enough tight ends. You can never have enough defensive linemen. You can never have enough, you know, interior offensive linemen. You can never have enough running backs. I mean, maybe you could have enough running backs, but you can never have enough talent on your team. Sometimes talent outweighs a need. You know, a lot of times when you're in a draft, you want need and talent to kind of match up with one another in your selections, especially early in the draft. As you get later in the draft, to hell with, you know, positions of need. It's all about talent at that point. You get to the fifth, the sixth, the seventh round, you don't give a shit about, you know, is this guy fitting a need that we have on our roster? He's like, no, let's just get the most talented guy and we'll figure it out. But early in the draft, you're trying to draft for needs. You're trying to plug holes on your roster. So corner would more so satisfy what is a little bit of a hole on this roster, whereas at receiver, you just say, look, like I, I and the Cowboys are the example that I keep giving in last year's draft with CeeDee Lamb. They didn't, they needed edge rusher more than they needed wide receiver. And they had an edge rusher sitting on the board. The edge rusher from LSU was sitting right there in front of them. They could have taken an edge rusher. They could have taken a corner. They needed cornerback help desperately. They ultimately got uh, Trayvon Diggs in the second round, but they could have taken a corner right there. There were several corners available at the time of their pick, but they didn't expect CeeDee Lamb to be there at the time of their selection. And they said, we can't pass up on this. I think they would have been perfectly fine re-signing Michael Gallup and just moving on with Gallup and with Amari Cooper and just keeping that group together because Michael Gallup looks like a stud. He really does. And they've got a decision to make. And I think that decision is going to be ultimately to let him walk after this upcoming season because he's going to be a free agent. And if he continues to play the way he's been playing, I don't think they're going to be able to afford him. But I think that would have been they would have been fine paying him. But now after getting C.D. Lamb, they can afford to let him walk because they still have enough talent to get by with Lamb and, and, and Amari Cooper. So I kind of feel like you do. Like, I don't know about him. I don't know about this, man. Devontae Smith, pretty damn hard to pass up if he's there at 19. I don't think he's going to get to 19, though. Honestly speaking, I think somebody takes him before uh, we get our chance to even select him. So we'll see what happens there but thank you for the super chat colton wheeler you bring up a great point one that i wrestled with over the weekend and i think it is a conversation worth having it really is if, if you get there and there are two bama guys that you love on the board which one do you go with I'm, I'm, you could make a strong case for Devonte smith at this point you really really can so let's get to smoke and mirrors and i want to start with the Cincinnati Bengals at five. They, they were a part of the discussion on Friday's podcast because remember, after trading out of three, the Dolphins then traded back up into the top seven at six 
with the Philadelphia Eagles who moved back to 12, picked up draft capital and felt good about sitting at 12. So then a rumor comes out that the Eagles wanted Zach Wilson. That's why they moved. That's bullshit. I told you it was bullshit the day we heard it on Friday. Like people were just grasping at straws because again, we live in an era where in social media, everyone wants immediate answers. We live in a, a era of immediacy. Everybody wants to come up with a reason as to why right now. And I just said, that one doesn't make any sense to me because they knew they before Zach Wilson's pro day, they knew that the chances of Zach Wilson getting past the, the Falcons at four, damn near impossible if he got past the Jets at two. So unless they were willing to go up to three, it wasn't happening. And maybe, just maybe, they called the Dolphins first and they weren't willing to give up what the Dolphins were asking for and that's how the 49ers swooped in. Again, it doesn't matter. Zach Wilson wasn't getting to number three. So I just didn't buy that. That's not why they traded out of six. It had to be a different reason. And remember, I was adamant, oh, Cincinnati's taking an offensive tackle. Got to take a tackle, right? Got to protect Joe Burrow, right? And then I started reading reports about them wanting to reunite. Reunited and it feels so good. Want to reunite Joe Burrow and his main man, Jamar Chase, at five. And I said, what? <laughs> what? You just took a, a, a receiver at uh, 33 in the second round last year. You're not taking a receiver here. You got receivers, right? Right? So I went and I looked at their roster and I looked at their list of receivers. I said, you got receivers, right? Right? Wrong. <laughs> they, they don't have a number one wide receiver on that squad, okay? The kid they took out of Clemson last year um, in the second round is a number two receiver. He looks good. Looks damn good to me. He's a number two. Um, Tyler Boyd, to me, is the best number three receiver or one of the best number three receivers in the league. And you could argue he's a number two, to be honest with you. Whatever the case may be, he's not a one either. So um, they've got a void. They need a number one. And I said, damn. And then, you know what I said? I'm not comfortable with Riley Reef as my left tackle or my right tackle for that matter. I don't really give a shit what tackle he's playing. I don't want Riley Reef out there. But they said, hey, man, we got a chance to get Jamar Chase. <laughs> we can't pass that up. We can get a tackle somewhere else in the draft, right? Can't get another Jamar Chase, though. Facts, all facts. But we're talking about Joe Burrow here. Like, you want to make sure you're protecting him. Uh, you got Jonah Williams. I'd love to pair Jonah Williams with another bookend tackle and say, hey, we got our tackle situation locked up for the next decade right here with these two dudes. Or you could say, hey, we got Jonah Williams in a possible. We could play spades with, with Joe Burrow's knees like we did last year. Deal the hand, and then you get a hand, and you got a bunch of funnies in your hand, and you only got one spade. Mm, sucks to be you. Because right now with, with Jonah Williams and Riley Reef, you got one in a possible in terms of tackles. I don't know if I would do that if I were them, but they sound like they're poised to take Jamar Chase. The, the acquisition of Riley Reef in the offseason, and I think they've done a lot of things to try to fortify their guard position in the interior of their offensive line, whether via the draft or free agency. Uh, I think they feel good about their offensive line enough to the point where I'm not saying they won't draft an offensive lineman or two throughout the course of this draft. I just don't think they're pulling the trigger on one at five. I, I think I'm changing my mind as we speak. I think that the Eagles moved and it makes a lot of sense. This is why I'm changing my mind because I tried to make sense of why the Eagles all of a sudden were willing to move out of out of six it just didn't make sense that the whole zach wilson angle that was cute but that didn't make any sense those dots didn't connect for me and then it, it hit me they needed look they drafted 22 twos last year in the draft the kid that they drafted we wasted the 21st pick on you the kid they drafted last year in the draft uh jalen rager he's a two I could have told them that. I could have saved them the time, the trouble, the headache, all that, and say, take Justin Jefferson, you dummies. They took Jalen Rager. Good for them. I love it. Want more of it. Then they proceeded to take 
you know, Quay Watkins, Quez Watkins, and and, a, and the kid from Boise State, a bunch of burners with no hands. Cool. Love it. Awesome. So they staring at their receiver group and they saying, man, we, we don't have a one in sight. They wanted. They wanted Jamar Chase. And when they realized Cincinnati, and it's just hard for me to, to stomach that they know this already, and so they trade it out. What if the, the Bengals get a change of heart and say, nah, we didn't take a tackle. And you could have had Jamar Chase if that's who you really were after. It's hard for me to uh, imagine them moving out of six as if they know what the Bengals are going to do. Maybe they do. But that's why I'm changing my mind because Philadelphia doesn't move for any other reason than their guy isn't going to be there or guys aren't going to be there at six. And you have to assume that it isn't a tackle that they're after at six that would force them to move. It's got to be a receiver. It's got to be Jamar Chase. So I think the Bengals are set to take Jamar Chase at five. I think I'm leaning towards that. I think that makes the most sense. Speaking of which, that takes me to my next smoke and mirrors. Dolphins to take offensive tackle at six. Remember, I was adamant on Friday. They're either coming up here for one or two players. It's either Jamar Chase. They want the number one wide receiver on the board and the Bengals are taking a tackle. Well, I think that's a, a myth that I just debunked. Okay? Just debunk that theory, right? I think they're taking a wide receiver. So it, it, it isn't Jamar Chase that they're tra- trading up for. And I said, well, then it's got to be Micah Parsons. They're coming up for the stud out of Penn State. Well, not exactly. Uh, not exactly. Is it Hurts? Not exactly. I looked at their roster and I'm like, hmm. I don't think this is for a receiver because I looked at their receiving core and remember they added Will Fuller in the offseason to go along with Devontae Parker. So right there in that mix, you got a one somewhere. Either Devontae Parker you view as a one or Will Fuller, even if it's a temporary one, it's a rental one. I think Will Fuller is more of a two, uh, but it, he's a high end two, okay? If he's not a one. If he's a one, he's a very, very low end one. Whatever the case may be, There's enough there for you to come up with a one between Parker and Will Fuller, the fifth. And then you look at all the ancillary parts and there's Jakeem Grant and there's Preston Williams and all these guys that they took in the draft. And I'm like, or or all these guys they have on the the roster and Albert Wilson is still there. And like, they got enough stuff out there. Plenty of shit. Guys coming off of the COVID list, they're gonna be just fine at receiver. They don't need to take one at six. So I said, nah, this this can't be for a receiver. It's got to be for the linebacker, right? Then I started looking at the linebacker position, and I just remembered. Well, I didn't remember. I actually had to look at the roster to see this. They traded for Bernardrick McKinney. Like, that kind of slipped under the radar. One of those days we didn't do a podcast. It happened. It was quiet. Nobody was talking about it. Huh, that was interesting. Kept it pushing. They traded for Bernardrick McKinney. They got a middle linebacker. Not to mention a Landon Roberts, who they got from New England. Van Ginkle, who had a strong year. Andrew Van Ginkle out of Wisconsin was fantastic for them last year. And they also have Duke Riley for more depth. They don't, they're not hurting at linebacker. I mean, Michael Parsons is better than all those guys I just mentioned, but they're not hurting for linebacker. So then I said, well, is it tackle? Really? Did they come up here to six to get the best tackle in the draft, who they perceive to be the best tackle in the draft? Did they come up to six to pop the top on the tackle position? And I looked at their tackles and I said, oh, yeah, they did. They, they, they don't have a really confident tackle situation. They got a bunch of guards that uh, could, could double as tackles. Nobody wants to hear, hey, I got a guard that can play tackle, though. Nah, that's not what we're after. We want a tackle that plays tackle. Not a guard, not a guard that can play tackle, but a tackle that plays tackle. They drafted one last year out of USC in in Jackson. And remember, I told you, I wasn't a big Austin Jackson fan. But after that, they got nothing out there. And so I think 
This is for a tackle. So I think the Dolphins came back up to six to get a tackle. And maybe they had one in mind in particular that they wanted. Unlike last year where they really didn't have control over which tackle they could take. They essentially had to take the one that was left because they had to get Tua with their first pick. So they couldn't take a tackle then. And by the time they got on the board the second time around, all the tackles were gone. All the premier tackles, the Makai Becktons and the Jedrick Wills and all of those guys, the Tristan Wirfs, all of the guys that they would have preferred, the big four, gone already. So this year they said, that shit's not happening to us again. We trade back to 12. Who knows what we'll end up with? More likely than not, they would have gotten a quality tackle. But they said, we're not leaving it to chance this year. We're going back up to six. We're going to get our damn tackle. We're going to get the right one this time around. Hmm, interesting. I wouldn't rule them out going in a different direction, but I think the Dolphins came up. They said, if if we're going to do this to a thing, we're going to do it right. We got them enough weapons. We may draft a running back. But we, we went out and we've gotten some weapons at the running back position and at the receiver position. Um, they, they may go and look tight end at some point to, to I think they've got enough tight ends, but you, you never know. You can never have enough, as I've mentioned already. But they said, look, we've gotten him all the weapons he needs. Now we just need to make sure he, he's upright. He's healthy. He's not panicking back there. I think they're going to take a tackle. Really firmly do believe that. So. That's some draft smoke there. Uh, So I think we can nail down the first six selections. I don't know who exactly the Dolphins fancy at six. I just think they're taking a tackle. I can't tell you who's the best tackle on their board. But the first five picks, I I feel really confident about. I, I, I could tell you my top five in my mock draft. You already know if you've been paying attention. So I think the Dolphins take a tackle at six. We'll see. Uh, We'll have plenty of time. Or we'll have essentially a month to talk about that. Justin Fields runs a faux, 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 a Moses Malone 40, a faux, faux, faux at his pro day today. And we got to see it again. Remember the first time they were saying he ran like a 4-4-1 or something like that, 4-4-3. Ran a faux, faux, faux today. Again, Kellen Mond ran a 4-5-7 at his pro day today. Who gives a shit? Honestly, I I mean... We talked about Mac Jones's 40, and I'm hearing that that 40 was somewhere in the neighborhood of 468 to 472. Are you guys hearing that too? Like, we were talking, I was telling you that 486 wasn't a bad time for him. If he ran a 468 between a 46, let's just call it a 47 flat. That's insane because I don't see that now. I will say I've, I've watched indirectly because i've watched jalen waddle and i've watched more of uh, uh Devontae smith i indirectly have seen more mac jones and i'm going to tell you he's a little bit more mobile than we're giving him credit for he just he's unwilling to run that's his problem i don't think he's incapable i just think he's unwilling to sort of like kirk cousins kirk isn't incapable of running he's actually a pretty solid athlete He just doesn't like to run. And by the time he makes up his mind to run, it's too damn late. I think Mac Jones falls in that same category. Anyway, uh, Fields running a faux, faux, faux doesn't change my mind on him at all. And people making a big deal about this. Oh, this is the fastest 40 we've seen since Robert Griffin III ran a 4-4-1 back in 2012. How'd that turn out for him? Like, you know, how often is it that we get to see a quarterback run in a straight line? Those guys are zigging zigging and zagging and they rarely get to open up and we see that pure unadulterated speed. It's rare. You get the instance where you you break through the line of scrimmage and they come with an all out blitz or the safety's not home and you break through that first wave of contain and all of a sudden there's nothing but green grass ahead of you. But that's so rare. How often is it that you see a quarterback other than like a Lamar uh, Jackson or somebody like that? get one of those avenues where he breaks a run or something like it's rare we don't get to see that very often in this league so i I don't make much of these guys running fast it's good to know that they have that uh, ability but okay cool whatever did you see 
the throw that Justin Fields made at his pro day. I, it, I gotta admit, it was pr- impressive. I, I told you, I don't really give a shit about these pro days and, and these throws that they're making. You know, people make a lot. I told you, a wise man once told me, it's only a story when the opposite happens. Slow guys run slow, fast guys run fast. Pro days are supposed to go good. When pro days go bad, that's when they're a story. None of these pro days are gonna go bad. These guys, they're, they're good athletes. They've practiced for this day. They're going to make these throws. This is what they've been practicing for since their seasons ended. They're, they're gonna make most of these throws. Yeah, they're gonna miss a few. Shit, you're gonna miss throws. Whether it's the defense out there or not, you're gonna miss some throws. You're gonna make most of them though. He made a hell of a throw though. It was. Did you see the Zach Wilson throw? That's the throw to end all throws at a pro day. Well, I'll tell you what, Justin Fields throw wasn't that much different. Um, it, it doesn't change my mind on how I feel about Justin Fields, but that that's a good throw for him. Uh, Caleb Farley. Falling. Falling down draft boards despite running a 4-2-8-40 on March 5th. Did you find this interesting? This is why I'm talking about smoke and mirrors. All right. His agency, his handlers, they had this in their back pocket. Okay. How does a man that runs a 4-2-8-40 on March the 5th with video evidence of it, how does this not get released until March the 20, you know, 7th? You know how it doesn't get released? Because they were saving this nugget for when he had surgery or announced he was having surgery and all of the backlash was coming and all of the Caleb Farley is damaged goods, uh, articles were being written and he was going to drop. They were saving this 40 for when all the negativity started to rain down. They could inject a different narrative into the discussion. Hey, I know you want to talk about his back, but look at this 42840 he ran. Hey, when was that? Hey, it was March the 5th, but look at this 42840 he ran. Why is a March 5th pro day coming out now? And it wasn't really a pro day, it was more of a workout at his um the facility he's working out at. Why is this just coming out now? Because this was a marketing ploy by his agency. Hey, we're gonna hold on to this one, keep this one in our back pocket. This is like they're ace in the hole for when we need it. They knew the negative pub was coming because they knew their client had to have this uh, disectomy. And I told you, man, I don't know about no goddamn disectomy, man. I told you, I'm not comfortable with that shit. And it sounds like a lot of teams are like, hey, man, this guy's uber talented. We love the skills that he brings to the table. But I don't know, man. I ain't really comfortable about this. I'm not. I already told you how I feel about Caleb Farley. The 428 is fine. You can tell me he'll be ready for camp all you want. I, I don't know, man. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm going to keep it a buck and some change. I'm not comfortable with a dude who's had back issues in the past having to relieve pressure in his back with a minor procedure. Uh, I'm good. On his back? Really? We having back issues at 21 or 22, however old he is? We having back issues now? Well, that doesn't fare well. That doesn't age well. I, I mean, look, if he were to slide and fall, somebody's going to take him. And even if he doesn't go in the first round, he would go in the first round. This isn't the same situation as the Cowboys getting their hands on Jalen Smith or the uh, Jaguars to a much lesser degree getting their hands on um, Miles Jack because those guys were going to miss the upcoming season, I believe, especially Jalen Smith. I don't know about Miles Jack. He might have been coming off the injury, but you know people were really worried about his knee. So he was, I think, an exception to that rule. I think they just said, hey, man, his knee doesn't look good for the future. Um, we're going to pass on him right now. Um, I, I, I don't see Caleb Farley falling out of, the, um, out of the first round. You know, even if teams are uncomfortable with his um, health long term, I just don't see him falling out of the first round. But I could see him not going off the board as the first corner, despite some people and teams and, and scouts having him rated higher than Patrick Sertan. I think he's a better athlete than Sertan. I think he might actually be the better corner of the two. But, I, you know, I, I got to have a guy that's available. We talked about ab- availability being the best ability. You question that with Caleb Farley. So I think that's a legitimate thing. Um, let's. I got a couple of super chats. I want to take those real quick. 
Um, let's see. I got a super chat here from TQS underscore zero eight. TQS underscore eight. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Who writes? Do you buy that the 49ers want Matt Jones at number three? No, I don't. And I, I literally spent the first 30 minutes. And you probably just got here when you sent that. So you didn't know. But no, I'm doubling down on that. I think they're they're going to draft Trey Lance. I think this is all smoke and mirrors. Gun smoke, gun smoke. They let off some shots on Friday. And um, they got gun residue um, all over their hands from pulling the trigger on Friday. And now it's a bunch of just smoke filling the air right now. And you can't tell if they... It's a smoke screen. Like them going to Matt Jones's pro day today over Justin Fields. I think it's more of a smoke screen. It's just why. Um, this is the thing though. At this point, why are we looking to play games? Like you got the third pick in the draft. You don't have to fool anybody. It's like the dude out here dribbling, trying to cross somebody up, and there's nobody out here to cross up. Just shoot the J. You open. You out here still dribbling. For what? Shoot it. Probably because your ass can't shoot. At this point, if you're the 49ers, why are we playing games? Like, that's why Daniel Jeremiah is like, man, all signs are pointing to them taking Mac Jones. Like, why are they here? Like, they, they don't have to play games anymore. Like, they're not drafting sixth. And teams are in front of them. And they want to make it seem like they're okay taking Mac Jones if, if they don't get their hands on Trey Lance and, you know, Justin Fields. You had three. After the first two QBs go, you get to take the next guy. So... They don't have to play games. But I just, I don't really know what, what they're up to. I still don't really know. I, I still think it's Trey Lance, personally. But we'll see what happens. Thank you for the super chat, uh, TQS underscore zero eight. Got another super chat. This one's from Chauncey Davis. Thank you for the super chat. My man Chauncey Davis writes, Lou, I'm still in the back seat riding with you and Ron. My seatbelt's on Ron's plan. Don't take it off. Don't take it off. Even when it gets a little bumpy, man, and we'll hit some rough terrain. Trust me. You ever driven downtown in one of these cities that try to preserve the feel of an old town city? You know, it was built in the... 1600s with these cobblestone roads and they don't change the roads it's a bunch of stones and you're like man this shit is terrible they need to repave all of this shit dig all these damn stones up put some damn cement down and smooth this shit out you ride it's a couple of places you know where i'm from like that um it could get like that you know, we could be driving down a few streets like that with Ron in the front and, you know, with Ron behind the wheel. Don't take off your seatbelt. Last year, there are a lot of people that took off the seatbelt. Don't take your seatbelt off. So you should be in it for the long haul, man. I don't mind you asking a couple of times, are we there yet? Are we there yet? I'm going to just look back and say, nah, we're not there yet, man. Just sit back and relax, you know? Well, I got to pee. We'll pull over and we'll stop when we need gas, but just just be easy back there. We'll, we'll be fine. So I'm glad you still got your seatbelt on because a lot of people took theirs off last year for some reason. One or the other. Um, thank you for the super chat, Chauncey Davis. Got another one here from John Livingston, my man, J.L. Smooth. Thank you for the super chat who writes, what up, Lou? Recently heard that our 17th game is against none other than the Washington football team. Easy dubs. Ha ha ha. Just kidding. Hope all is well. Well, I talked about that on the podcast, and I told you guys that the 17th game of the season, when it was, and we're going to talk about that actually today at the end of this show, uh, but I already had talked about the 17th game and that it would be Washington and the Buffalo. So that was a known fact already. And um, it might be an easy dub. I, I mean, I don't think it's going to be easy, but I expect you guys to beat us. But uh, we'll see what happens, you know. That's why they play the game, as a wise man once told me. So we will see. Um, everything is well. Um, I hope all is well with you and your family as well. Thank you for the super chat and the support, as always. JL Smooth. Jay, let's go to Miami for a second as we get back to some smoke and mirrors here. Let's go, let's go to Miami. And they had their pro day. 
the other day. And some really eye-popping numbers for Jalen Phillips, my number one edge rusher in the upcoming 2021 NFL Draft. Jalen Phillips, 6'5", 260, so all of that is legit. 33 and 1 fourth inch arms. So 33 inch arms. I told you, I said, I bet you this guy's, <clears throat> excuse me, has 33 or 34 inch arms, which <clears throat> equals out to an 80 and three quarters wingspan, which is ridiculous. He ran a four, five, six, guys. That's, that's pretty damn special. And I told you, it's not the talent that concerns me with Jalen Phillips. I've made mention of this already when I broke him down. I said, it's not the talent that I'm concerned with. It's not his body type. All of those things translate well to the next level. For me, it's the, it's how much does he love the game? And that's not something we can quantify at a pro day. Or that's not something teams are going to find out when they sit down and talk to them, even though, you know, you, they're, they're going to try. But to me, if you're looking off of just pure talent, Jalen Phillips should be the first edge rusher off the board. How? Why do I feel so confident about that? Gregory Russo is my number two edge rusher in the draft. I think his future, though, is more of an interior guy than an uh, exterior guy. We'll see. Let's talk about Gregory Russo because he's becoming really polarizing in this draft. 6'6", 266. So all of that checks out. That's what we uh, were told by Miami and their program. And it turned out to be spot on. 34 and three quarters arms in terms of inches. Yikes. Told you that. You're essentially talking about 35-inch arms. Those are tackle arms, man. Those elite tackle arms. And those are vines, is what the... Let's call a spade a spade. 83 and a quarter inch wingspan is what that amounts to. Yikes! Zoinks! Scoob! Ran a 4.69 if you take his best 40 time of the day. Awesome for a guy his size. Here's the thing that people that don't like Gregory Russo are pointing to. At his pro day, and this is the thing I noticed on tape and I said, hmm, those ankles are very tight. You don't see a lot of ankle flexion. You don't see a guy that bends very well. I I always cited his length as a problem. And if he ever learned how to use it, which is why I comped him to Chandler Jones. But that's where the similarities end. Chandler Jones is a much better athlete than that of Gregory Rousseau in terms of quickness and being able to turn a corner. um, That's just not there for Rousseau. He ran a 7.5 flat three cone. I'm going to pull out my mobile device here because I did some digging to find out what are so I already knew that a 7.5 for an edge rusher isn't a good three cone. But I wanted to get some comparables at you know the interior and edge rushing positions to kind of give you a bit of framework from which to work as to what you should be looking for. So if you're looking for a good time for an edge rusher, the average time is 7.23. Okay, so I always knew seven to somewhere in that neighborhood is is a good time. You're fine. You want to be elite. You need to be in a 7.1 range. Anything below that and you're a problem turning the corner more likely than not. You got the kind of quickness that NFL teams are looking for. I'll give you some time. So the guy that I comped him to Chandler Jones, 7.07 three cone. That's not close. 7.5 isn't 701 or 707. That's not even close. So I comped him to Chandler Jones because of his size, his length, but he's, he didn't have the quicks like Chandler Jones. Khalil Mack, 
point zero eight three cone. Von Miller, this, this is when you start getting into that elite territory. When we talk about smooth rushers, that's when you get into this next category. I've always said Khalil Mack isn't smooth as a pass rusher. His rush is segmented, it's choppy, but it's powerful. It's impactful. Von Miller is silky smooth. 6.70. Three comp. That's bonkers. Ryan Kerrigan, even Ryan Kerrigan's stiff ass. 7.18. That's a that's actually a good time for him. Three cone. Cam Jordan, 707. Uh, 7.07 7 for Cam Jordan. Aaron Donald as an interior defensive lineman. Most interior defensive linemen have a 7.5. That's what you're looking for. 7.5. That's the neighborhood you're in. 7.11. He's got a 7.11. It's ridiculous. Aaron Donald is. Melvin Ingram, 6.83. Another problematic pass rusher. Let's see. Here's a good comp right here. Demarcus Lawrence ran a 7.46 three cone. He's one of those guys. And you know what? That might actually be a better comp for him. A Demarcus Lawrence. I thought that he was a lot longer than Demarcus Lawrence. Let me check and see what Demarcus Lawrence's measurables are. I don't think his arms are anywhere near as long as as um like his length. I didn't he didn't strike me because he's not like a six five six six dude. Demarcus Lawrence is more of a six three guy. Let's see what he measured out at when he came into the league. So he, he measured in at 6'2 and 7 eighths, so 6'3. 251, so the weight wasn't there either. 33-inch arms, not really close. You're talking about a guy that got 35-inch arms. Uh, and he ran a 4'8", 40-yard dash. I think his numbers are much more comparable, though, in terms of athleticism. I just I was looking for the size uh, aspect and piece and what I saw. I remember when I saw Chandler Jones, I saw a lot of uh, Gregory Rousseau, but I can tell you that with Rousseau, he's not as quick. And, you know, there were reports that he ran the three cone twice. The first time he kicked the cone that he was supposed to go around, he ran it a second time and almost fell trying to go around the cone. So that tells you that the coordination and the skill there, you know, the agility isn't quite there with Rousseau. And that there are people who have been echoing that for a long time. Like, look, be careful. This guy is not what you think he is. I would have really liked to have seen him one more season to see if there was growth. Remember, this is a guy still learning the position, didn't come to Coral Gables as an edge rusher. He came as a wide receiver, safety uh, recruit. So. I just find it hard to believe that he's a finished product. Far from it at this point. I, I think there's still quite a bit of upside. And he could morph into a dominant pass rusher in this league. I would bet against that. But I, I would be willing to spend the first round pick to find out. Because you, six six with 35-inch arms that runs a sub 4'7", they don't grow on trees. I'd love, if I've got a coaching staff that I believe in, I'd love to find out if this guy can do it or not. And I'd be willing to spend the first round pick to find out. Quincy Roche, you know, that's my guy. You know, of all these guys that we talk about, Jalen Phillips is my guy in terms of smooth, effortless, uh, pass rusher, should be the first off the board. But Roche, to me, is the best value of this group. Um, we know what he is. He's, he's more of a... Uh, of an, a 3-4 outside linebacker stand up, you know, two-point stance off the edge. Ran a 4-6-2, which is a tremendous time for him. Um, 23 reps of two and a quarter. I told you he was stout at the point of attack. Very physical, crafty, savvy guy. Um, that twin, Those 23 reps were the best among the group of him, Phillips, and Rousseau. Now, keep in mind, it's a lot easier to, to pump up iron when your arms aren't as long. You're talking about a guy 
and myself with longer arms for my size. So I know all about the struggle of getting all the way to the apex and coming back down. It's a lot easier for guys with short stubby arms to get it up, get it back down, get it up, get it back down. For me, long arms, you know, it could be a bit of a struggle. So when you're talking about guys with respectively 33 and 35 inch arms, it could be a little bit of a struggle to get it up there a number of times. But uh, Roche got it up 23 times. So well, that was also good to see from him as well. By all accounts, he had a great day. And I think he's going to be a really good pro. I've, I've said that. Uh, somebody's going to get themselves a hell of a football player in day two of this draft. And then this is guy is a wild card, I think, at the tight end position. Not a lot of people are talking about Brevin Jordan from the U. But uh, he measured in at 6'2 and some change. Did Brevin Jordan, about 6'2 and a half. And um, 247 pounds, 33-inch arms, ran a 4'6'7, which is his best time. He was rated in the neighborhood of 4'7'1, 4'6'9, 4'6'7. I, just, I always take the best time that you got. Um that's a really good time for him. And I think he's probably going to be a day three guy more likely than not. Because um, I just don't think this is a tight end draft that's very deep. I think people kind of view this tight end draft similar to the one that we had last year. It's it's more like the one we had last year. I don't think it's quite that way. Remember, we didn't have a first-round tight end last year. We will definitely have a first-round tight end. As a matter of fact, we will have a top-10 tight end this year. I don't think Pat Fryermuth, who I think is going to end up being the second tight end taken in this draft, don't think he's going to end up being a first-rounder. But I think he will be. I feel pretty confident saying he will be a second-round pick. And then after him, <clears throat> that's when I think you just kind of see – players all over the board you know what I mean teams all over the place with their evaluations on these tight ends and where it is appropriate to take them and, and a guy like Brevin Jordan I think is going to be really intriguing to see where he ultimately lands and with whom and what they plan to do with him because he is a talent you know I remember watching him in 2019 and saying to myself this guy's got a hell of a lot of talent you know still needs a lot of developing but got some talent so um i, I thought he, he he showed well at the pro day you know with those times and him his measurements now it's about putting that to good use on the football field we'll see where he gets an opportunity to do that so that's gonna do it for smoke and mirrors we'll talk so much more about the draft in the coming weeks and we'll have so much more content about the draft because of how close we're getting and how these players kind of fit in to the upcoming 2021 NFL draft. Let's wrap this show up with garbage time. Before we get into garbage time, though, you know what I'm about to do. Quickly going to ask you guys to subscribe to the Louis T Network podcast for more great content. Turn on that notification bell if you haven't already done so. And hit the like button all right we're getting close to the century mark dangerously close i love it 91 likes but we're not quite there yet 175 plus of you out there so more than enough of you guys for this thing to be up over 100 if you haven't hit the like button please 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 do me a massive solid and hit the like button can't begin to thank you enough for that let's get that thing up over the century mark so with that said let's get to garbage time and this is the last time we'll talk about this because i feel like we're beating a dead horse we've talked about this at least two maybe even three times on this podcast but it's now official 17 game schedule is in full effect we said this was going to happen i told you i thought it was going to be unanimously voted past um We knew this was going to happen. We were prepared for this. I've given you all the information you need on this. I tried the best I could to explain to you how it was going to work. It might have gotten a little um, choppy in the way I explained it. I felt in the moment as I was saying it like, man, I think you had a great way of wanting to explain it in your head. And as you started talking, it kind of got wordy and it might have gone a little south. 
I don't know. Maybe you guys understood it. Maybe you didn't. I don't know if I did a, uh, the best of jobs of explaining it, but essentially um, that 17th game on the schedule is going to come from a, a team in the opposite conference. They're starting with the, the division you played two seasons ago, and you're going to play the division that you played in the AFC two seasons ago. You're going to play the team that finished in the exact same spot in their respective division as you did in your division. So if you finished in first place, you're going to play the first place team in the AFC conference that you played two years ago. So in, in, for instance, in the NFC East, two years ago, they played the uh, AFC East. Uh, division. So um, Washington finished in first place last year, so they're going to get the first place Buffalo Bills. And every AFC team is going to host this year. Next year, every NFC team is going to host. And they're just going to alternate years on who's home and who's away for this seventh ga uh, 17th game. So every AFC team is going to be home. So uh, one of the juicy matchups that was created because of this is Patriot or um, uh, Chiefs and Packers, which is what we wanted for the Super Bowl. Remember, we were supposed to get Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes two years ago, but Mahomes was injured and we ended up getting Matt Moore versus Aaron Rodgers. Not as thrilling, but the game actually turned out to be really good as the Chiefs uh, found a way, I think, to win that football game, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on a Sunday night. Either way, um, so we might actually finally get Rodgers Mahomes for the first time. That's going to be played at Arrowhead uh, in Kansas City because all the AFC teams have the home game in 2021 when this 17 uh, game season hits its inaugural season. So um, to repeat one final time, the NFL has officially passed, the owners have officially passed, they're in those uh, league meetings, uh, passed the 17 game schedule. And you know, a lot of people are making fun of the NFL PA because uh, these owners are so smart. They're so clever. Um, not only did they get the and look, they had to do this. They had they they had to come to some sort of an agreement. The old CBA was going to run out, so they got them to agree on a new CBA. But no sooner than than they agree to the new CBA, you get not only uh, a reduced cap due to no fans in the stands, which is total utter bullshit. They could have survived. All right. They got all this. They got a new TV deal, new media deal, as they call it. So a bunch of new money coming in over one hundred and ten billion dollars over the next 11 years. And then you add into the fact that you're getting rid of a preseason game and adding another regular season game for even more revenue for these owners. And I don't know if the players are really benefiting from any of this. Now, you know, they always say the more money the owners make, the more money the players make. And there is some validity to that. There is some truth to that because the more money that the uh, owners make, the more the cap goes up, the more the owners have to spend, the more money that players make. So uh, there is some validity to that, but feels like the players have gotten the raw end of this deal with the cap being reduced and so many guys uh, getting uh, low ball offers or lower deals than the market would have suggested had this been a normal offseason. I don't think they necessarily had to do the whole reduced cap thing. Uh, the, the owners could have said, you, no, we're fine. We're fine. But that's not what they're going to do. I, I told you, the only thing that rich people like more than having money is making more of it. And so if, if you tell the owners, hey, you guys are fine. You could actually have the cap just stay where it was at last year. And, you know, you'll be fine and you'll make all of that money back and, and then some. You'll make money hand over fist with this new TV money that's coming. You don't have to reduce the cap. They'd say, what are you talking about? We got a chance to put some money back in our pockets. You crazy? Give us an excuse to cut some players that we probably wanted to cut. Save us some salary that we wanted to save, but we couldn't because we had the money. Now we got an excuse. We're going to use it. What are you talking about? Shut up and get out of here. So... I don't know. I just feel like the uh, the players have gotten the raw end of the deal. And this 17th game, this isn't something that the players desired. Like, I saw yesterday, I believe, it was yesterday, that Alvin Kamara was like, this is bullshit. This 17th game is dumb. Like, it's already hard enough for us to get through 16 of these son bitches. You're going to add a 17th? And, you know, they try to make it as if they're doing these players a favor. By adding 
you know, a, a regular season game and taking away a meaningless preseason game, those veterans don't give a shit about that preseason game. The preseason is more for the guys on the bubble trying to make the roster. A guy like Alvin Kamara, he's cool with sitting out, you know, the fourth preseason game. He's cool with having that extra preseason game uh, to get ready for the season and, and not have to worry about it. He's cool with that. You know, that's not no hair off his back. But here they are deciding that, hey, we're doing you guys a solid one less preseason game so you guys don't get hurt and give you another regular season game. These players don't want that. And I'm telling you, I don't think it's going to be 43 years like it was between the 16th and the 17th game being added. I don't think we're going another 47 years before uh, this thing changes over to 18. It's only a matter of time before the preseason shrinks to two games and the regular season is expanded to 18. And I think the 18th game may come with an additional bye week, though. I think if they go to 18, you may see an additional bye week added in. And you may see the, the season start a week earlier. So instead of it starting the week after Labor Day, so whatever that first Thursday is after Labor Day is when the NFL season usually gets underway. I could see them starting the week prior um, uh, to Labor Day. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. It's it, it seems a bit far-fetched now, but if this thing goes well, which why wouldn't it, I could see them coming back after the next TV deal is up in 10 years and saying, you know what, that 17th game went over so well. We're running out of ways to extract more money out of this juggernaut of a product we have here. How can we make more money, even more money? I know, how about an 18th game? And the owners are gonna sit, think about it for two seconds and say, it's a hell of an idea, Jim Bob, uh, Jim Bob. you know? And uh, next thing you know, 18th game is gonna be thrown out there. They're gonna kind of throw it out there maybe a year in advance before they decide to do it, maybe two just like they did with this 17th game. They floated this around like three years ago. We started talking about it. I told you, I don't want it. I don't want it. I'm old man, get off my lawn. I like it the way it is. We're gonna have to change records. And now we're gonna have to talk about this record was with 16 games. Who gives a shit? Honestly, uh, like I could be old man, get off my lawn. But at the end of the day, this is what they ultimately are going to do. And I think they're gonna change it to 18 here before it's all said and done. I got another super chat here. This one is from Kevin the PRF. Thank you for the super chat, Kev. Greatly appreciate you, my man. Kevin the PRF writes, hashtag save the Pro Bowl. Conference winners should get the 17th game at home the following year. That will never happen because what you're essentially asking is you're asking for the players who don't give a shit about that last game that's supposed to be an exhibition. It's almost like what Major League Baseball did to the All-Star game. You're asking an exhibition game to now become something serious, having impact on something that it shouldn't. You know, at least with the All-Star game in baseball, it's played in season, okay? So these players can, can get the proverbial competitive juices flowing for something that may be on the line at like home field advantage in the World Series. Uh, you're asking players in the offseason who don't want anything to do with this game if they've already been once or twice to now say, hey, we're taking an exhibition game in the offseason and making it matter to impact your schedule for the upcoming season. There's no way the NFLPA would allow that. And frankly, I wouldn't want that as a player. As much as we want, you know, competition and games like that as a fan, there's no way players would be receptive to that. And I don't blame them. Again, if I'm Russell Wilson and I've already been to five Pro Bowls, I don't want to go this year. But you're telling me the difference between us potentially having, you know, the best record in football could come down to the 17th game being in Seattle or it being in Cleveland next season. Like that's, it's a bit of a stretch. It's a bit of a stretch because, you know, you look at it in, in the same light and you say, hey, maybe 
the Arizona Cardinals in our same division, they don't mind going to um, Miami or they don't mind going to the Jets. That's who they have to play. You know what I'm saying? That, that was the division they were playing. And you, on the other hand, are like, shit, we got to go to the, the, the Bills if we don't win this game. Like, we don't want to go to Buffalo, especially if that game's scheduled for, you know, late November or December. We don't want to go to Buffalo. Hell, they went to Buffalo and got their asses handed to them last year. They don't want to go back there. And so you're putting more emphasis on that game. I just, I don't see players wanting any parts of that, honestly. And I don't see players wanting to have that kind of pressure to perform in, in an exhibition. Again, if I've been to six Pro Bowls, I'm not going. If I don't feel like going, oh, yeah, I got an ankle. I'm sorry. Now, the NFC's got, you know, all third and fourth team alternates, and the AFC's got a bunch of young guys that are here for their first or second year. And so they're excited, and they got their, their roster is loaded and stacked. Meanwhile, the NFC's like, eh, whatever. It's just, it, it's hard to legislate the competition in a game like that. I just, I know you're trying to save the Pro Bowl, but I don't know if that game is worth saving or not. So, we shall see. But that's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T, on the 151st installment of the Louis T Network podcast. I thank you guys for joining me on this show. Um, I find the third pick overall and what the 49ers are going to do with it fascinating. We'll talk more about that as we continue to near the draft. Um, I also find the ripple effects of that deal, what's happening at five and six, and even to a lesser degree, what the Eagles are planning to do with 12. find all those things really fascinating. What the Panthers, all of a sudden, who are sitting there at eight and more likely than not, not going to end up with a quarterback. It's just crazy. Five quarterbacks could literally go. Seriously, before the eighth pick in the draft, could you imagine it, Mac Jones doesn't go? Let's just say the, the 49ers, it was gun smoke all along. And they smoke and mirrors. It's draft season. It's lion season. You know what I tell you? And so they ultimately go with uh, Trey Lance. And then the, the uh, Falcons say, don't mind if I do. They take uh, Trey uh, or Justin Fields, excuse me. And then you get the Bengals make their selection. The um, Dolphins make their selection. And then the Lions are like, look, Panthers might take them at eight. Who wants Mac Jones? And somebody comes up, Patriots come up to number seven and get their guy. It could happen. And just like that, five quarterbacks in the first seven picks. I don't know if we've ever seen anything like that before. I have to get my crack staff on that uh, those uh, statistics to see if we've ever seen five quarterbacks go on the first seven picks. I, I, I would venture to say it's never happened. Could happen. As the Burger King kid used to say, hey, it could happen. And I leave you with that thought right there. That's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. Signing off. Thank you for joining me on this 151st installment of Louis T Network podcast. We'll be back on Thursday to chop it up again talk about any happenings if we've got nothing we may throw it back on thursday and turn it into a throwback thursday episode who knows we'll see i don't want to make you guys any promises that i can't keep because i'm i'm drew hill over here and i'll never make a promise that i can't keep that ain't me no that ain't me so in any event you guys get the hell out of here it's tuesday night go enjoy yourself have a drink um it's on me I'll see you guys on Thursday. Have a good one. Take care. Mm -hmm.